Welcome to The Curator's Choice. My name is Anne Schaefer, and I am your host and resident curator. This is a podcast in which I talk about one work of art in each episode, usually a work on paper, well, almost always a work on paper, usually a print, actually. It's my way of revisiting works that I acquired for the Baltimore Museum of Arts collection from when I worked there in um, for 12 years, in 2005 to 2017. And I also sometimes talk about works that got away, ones that I wasn't successful in acquiring. In this episode, I'm going to talk about a work of art that I did not acquire for the museum. It was already in the collection when I got there in 2005. It had been acquired by my predecessor, Susan Dackerman. And it's a print by an artist named Charles White. Before we get to that, though, I want to make sure I make clear my positionality about what I do and who I am so that it's clear to you where I'm coming from. I identify as a cis het white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I'm recording this in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Let's take a micro break. And when I come back, we'll start talking about Charles White. Okay, so I forgot to mention that images that I talk about in this episode will be available in the show notes, and those can be found at my website, annschafer.com, or you can get to them also by um, the Curator's Choice Podcast.com. They both go to the same page. Also, there is a video that comes along with this story that I'm about to tell you that the link to that, to the YouTube um, version of it, will be also available on the show notes. Okay. So, <laughs> so first I wanted to just revisit four jaw dropping moments that I've had with art over the years, because this one, Charles White, the print I'm about to talk about, took me even farther than that. It took me to goosebumps and tears. That's pretty rare. Jaw droppers are, you know, um, jaw droppers are pretty cool too but the tears were kind of like, whoa, what just happened? <laughs> so the jaw droppers include when I was an undergraduate at the College of Worcester in an art history class with the professor Arne Lewis. He was talking about the late paintings of Edward Manet in a French 19th century class. And it, he had put up, and well, I was taking notes, so I didn't know what he put up. He was talking about a work and I finally looked up from my notebook <laughs> and there was this huge image because of course, you know, things that are pro um, projected on the wall are much bigger than they are in real life. I mean, the, the, the Manet painting is probably, you know, 15 by 12 or something. But there was this huge reproduction of one of his late paintings of a bouquet of lilac blooms in a crystal vase and a very dark background. So these blue, the white blooms popped off of the, off the surface. And my jaw literally dropped. I was like, Oh my God, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I think I'm trying to think why, I mean, you know, at that point when you're a young art student, you're still, um, you're still sort of taken with beauty and you haven't quite gotten to that conceptual rigor part. Um, but I, the way he paints water in a crystal vase and the way the, you know, the stem has to come down and just shift a little bit to make it clear that it's inside the water. I mean, the whole thing, when I look at it, I still can't figure out how he painted it. I mean, it's just, it makes me crazy. crazy. The second one was, uh, a painting that I saw at the Prado in Madrid when I was there for a courier trip. I was bringing some Rembrandt prints to um, an exhibition. And so I, I tootled off to the Prado and came around a corner and came upon Velázquez's painting La, Las Meninas, which is a, a family portrait of the royal family. Um, you probably are familiar with it. Again, the image will be in the show notes, but it's it's the Infantata uh, standing in the middle with some of her wait ladies in waiting, and there's a, a little person there next to her. And then the artist is standing to the left <clears throat> behind his canvas. And the royal couple, the king and queen, are standing in the background in the in the doorway. And and you, you're never quite sure what's reflecting where and who's standing doing what. And uh, it just... I don't know, there was just something about the way the composition came together. It was just so, 
I don't know, perfect in a way that made me, made me, made my jaw drop. I was, I didn't know anything about, I'm not, I am no Spanish scholar. Trust me. I'm, my specialty is American and British and mostly contemporary. So, you know, it's, um, it was, it was shocking to me that that painting could sing like that as I stood there. The third one has to do with Charles Demuth, who was one of my first loves. I wrote my um, my senior thesis in college on his work, on his watercolors. And um, Demuth was a, an artist in the early teens and 20s who was in the Stieglitz Circle and had come from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour and a half away from Baltimore. And he was a an invalid kid. He was often uh, laid up in bed. And so his mother would set him up on a, on a chaise long in their uh, garden so that he could watercolor the flowers and the things that she was growing back there. <clears throat> but at the same time, as he you know, got older, he would make paintings of American monuments to uh, progress, churches, um, steeple, steeple towers, um, grain elevators, factories, that kind of thing. The, the equivalent of European monuments to, you know, uh, cathedrals and that sort of thing. So, um, Sometimes these paintings of these, they're, they're called precisionist. He's, he adds these kind of lines and facets to it. That's, it's almost um, like cubism. I mean, it's just sort of teetering on the edge of cubism, but mainly they're, they're kind of modern-esque uh, images of church buyers and whatever, what, I have, what have you. So when my kids were still in car seats, we drove up to Lancaster in a gen during January one year and I wanted to go to the Demuth museum. And so when we pulled up to the street and the, the house museum is where he grew up, the house museum is next door to the tobacco shop, which was the family business. And it's in downtown, um, Lancaster on King street. I mean, it's a, you know, main drag. And I got out of the car and there was a sign on the door that said that the museum was closed in January because they took the month off because, the heating bill, I guess. And I, like, I can't believe I drove all the way up here. You know, I'd been waiting for years and years to finally make my pilgrimage to Lancaster and the museum was closed. But you could see that the, between the two buildings, there was a almost the width of your shoulder, a, a little brick alleyway that you could cut through to the back to see where the garden was that he had made all of these watercolors in. And so I just said, you know, to my husband, like, just hold on a second, I'll be right back. And I went on down and I got back to the garden and smack above your head is this church spire. I mean, it's the, the, that property abuts the back of this church. And so this church spire just raises right up over you as you're standing there. And I, you know, it's one of those like, Oh my God, like the whole thing, just every way that he was painting those churches and the factories and skyscrapers and whatever else, like it, it all was right there. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy. My jaw dropped. And the fourth one has to do with uh, Thomas Moran, who is a 19th century landscape artist who went out west and painted the quote unquote wilderness uh, ahead of the, the, those areas becoming national parks. So he painted a lot in Yellowstone, what is now called Yellowstone. And uh, I took my kids, my husband and I took the kids out there for a, you know, a national parks tour one summer, a couple of years ago. And we got to the mini Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, which is this sort of, you know, it's not it's not nearly as extensive as the Grand Canyon that's in the South, but it is in fact a canyon. And there's this beautiful river that runs down the through the center of it. And there's this beautiful waterfall at the end where you, you know, you can watch it from this beautiful vantage point, probably a mile away. And um, the way that Moran painted those rocks with, when you look at his paintings, you're like, wait, that can't be right. Cause the rocks are all yellow and white and pink. And they're these really bizarre tones. And when you're standing there looking at this river and those rocks, sure enough, that's what it looks like. <laughs> it's just like, what? I feel like I'm standing in the middle of a Moran painting. <laughs> it's sort of crazy. So even more rare is when you get goosebumps and tears, when you look at a work of art. So The Charles White linoleum cut that the Baltimore Museum owns, <clears throat> excuse me, is called uh, Voice of Jericho. And it features the head of, of just the sort of the from the mid chest up and a head of a, of a person whose mouth is open and his neck is sort of his chin is cocked up and 
there's open space above him that's sort of these swirls that are cut into the linoleum. And it's called uh, Voice of Jericho. And so it was a print that I used in um, classes frequently. And the students, you know, we talk about whether or not the figure in the work was singing or whether he was, you know, crying out in agony or whether he was screaming in frustration or what the emotion was. I mean, it was very, it's very clear that there is potential energy and potential emotion in this figure. And they, you know, they, they got it. Well, it turns out that the figure is in fact singing. And it turns out that the figure in the work is Harry Belafonte, who if you're of a certain age, you will know is a really well-known Calypso singer and activist who was um, singing and making television specials in the 50s and early 60s. And we had albums of his at home. And in fact, the first song I ever learned on guitar was Jamaica Farewell, one of one of his most uh, beloved songs. Um, so, you know, when it when that became clear to me that it was Belafonte, I thought, oh, of course, that makes so much sense. So Belafonte and Charles White, the artist, were friends. Charles White's a, a Black artist who <clears throat> was married for a short time to Elizabeth Catlett, if you can believe it. it didn't last very long. And um, his friendship with Belafonte ran pretty deep. So White was the subject of a monographic exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 2018 that was curated by Esther Adler. And the show, which was glorious, I have to say, started in Chicago at the Art Institute. And then it came to the Museum of Modern Art in the fall of 2018 and then went on to the L.A. County Museum of Art to conclude the sh to, to conclude its run. And the BMA's linoleum cut was in the Chicago venue for the show, but then it wasn't in the venue at the Museum of Modern Art, which is where I saw the exhibition, which was kind of curious to me. I, I was surprised that it wasn't there. Of course, I wasn't any longer at the museum, so I had no idea why it was recalled. I have no idea. <laughs> but when I went to see the show uh, during print week, with my friend Trude Ludwig, we were both just so excited to see the show because we knew it was going to be full of, you know, really wonderful works of art. Now, Print Week is the week in uh, early November that um, during which four print fairs occur. And so curators and dealers and artists and publishers descend on New York City from all over the country. And it's, it's like, you know, it's like print camp, you know, everybody has a wonderful time and you see old friends and, you know, it's really, it's really wonderful. So I always went as a curator because it was really one stop shopping for your year, you could find just about everything you would ever hope to acquire in that year with your budget. <clears throat> and I often had um, True Ludwig come up also, who uh, is a my art buddy and who teaches the history of prints at the Maryland Institute College of Art. True is the one who I am doing the history of prints as podcast episodes for my other podcast, Plate Mark. So you might check that out. He's nobody does it better than True. So anyway, we go into the exhibition and um, we're wandering around and we both happen upon the drawing from which the linoleum cut was based. The It's a portrait of Belafonte singing and it's bigger than the linoleum cut. Uh, it's almost, um, I think it's from Belafonte from the knees up. I'll have to double check the image and you can look at the image on the show notes. I'll put it up. Um, and it shows him with his hands sort of gesturing and then his voice and coming out of his mouth and his neck counted back and the, you know, the tendons in his neck all, uh, um, tense in song. And, um, it's, it's really quite amazing. And of course, as true. And I stood there, we both had the linoleum cut in our head because, you know, we used it for every class that he ever came in and taught because it's the best thing ever, <laughs> best thing ever. But around the corner from the drawing that is, by the way, owned to this day by Belafonte and his wife, there was a TV, a little screen on the wall that was running a loop from one of the TV series uh, specials that Belafonte did in um, 1959, Tonight with Belafonte. And the first song, it was, it was a loop of this one particular song that happened to be the first one performed in that show. Uh, in that special. And it's the song Bald Headed Woman. 
which is also on his uh, album Swing That Hammer and curiously was covered by The Kinks and The Who. The, the versions are very, very different. But as you stand there and watch, or sit there, wherever you're watching this this um, video loop, Belafonte is singing and there are um, uh, actors, dancers in the back who are acting out, um, hitting something with ha- a hammer in sort of a chain gang situation. They're all chained and they're shirtless with their, you know, their work jeans on. And um, it's a very sort of... Uh, visceral and uh, pointed, you know, Belafonte was an activist for civil rights and still is, of course. Um, And so the whole, the whole scene is, I mean, it's kind of astonishing that they were running it in, it it was on, you know, CBS or wherever it was running. Like, it's kind of, it's amazing to me that he got away with it because it's, it's so um, protest driven as it should be. In any case, as he's singing, uh, there's this part in the song where he has to kind of reach up for a high note. And as he does it, he his head cocks back and his neck, you can see the tendons in his neck and his voice is, you know, coming out of his mouth. And it's exactly, exactly what Charles White captured in the drawing and in the print. And all of a sudden, it all came together the way things do, you know, when you're like, oh my God, he totally captured the potential energy and the passion and the, you know, the frustration that Harry Belafonte was putting into his singing. And so as we're standing there watching this, you know, I kind of like grabbed his arm and True's got tears coming down his face and I'm like got goosebumps. And I mean, it's just, it it was just, I mean, it was almost too much. It was so spectacular. In any case, so Belafonte, as I said, and Charles White were uh, good friends. And in um, an exhibition catalog of Charles White's drawings from 1967, Belafonte wrote a note in in a preface about his work, about Charles White's work. Quote, you are enriched by the experience of having known Charles White's people who are like characters from a great novel that remain with you long after the pages of the book have been closed. And to me, that's, you know, the, the power, the lasting power, the staying power of a a really good print is that like, I carry this image with me all the time. And it was, I, I don't think it's, an exaggeration to say it's probably in the top five in the list of top five things that I would take home from the collection if I could, you know, there's like your favorite things. I think of them as my, especially the ones that I brought into the collection. I think of them as my kids almost, you know, they're like, Oh, my babies. And, um, you know, I kind of wish I had found it for the collection because it was just so great. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't me. It was already there when I got there. Thank goodness um, to Susan Decker. Thanks to Susan Deckerman for for finding and acquiring it for the collection. And also, you know, I'd like to thank Esther Adler for pulling the exhibition together. I, you know, I, I knew White's work, but I had never seen so much of it in one place at one time. And it was just, it was powerful and glorious and um, powerful and glorious. <laughs> It was so good. So thanks to her also. And of course, as usual, I always need to thank um, the artist for inspiring this episode, Charles White, who's no longer alive, but thank you wherever you are. And also want to send a thank you out to Michael Diamond, who has allowed me to use his original music for the theme song for these episodes. So thanks to him. And anyway, that's, I think that's it. You know, I think that's it. Uh, The Curator's Choice is produced by me, Anne Schaefer, as you know. And I do all of the sound editing and and all that stuff. So if it's crappy, I do apologize. But I do, uh, you know, I... I welcome your questions and I welcome your suggestions for works to look at really hard and think about and talk about. So, you know, get in touch. In other words, thank you. And I'll see you next time.